This lecture introduces us to the concept of electric circuits. <clears throat> and before we can talk about circuits, we need to talk about electric current. <clears throat> there are a number of topics that are going to be covered here. Most of them are fairly basic, so uh, don't let the number discourage you. Um, we're going to be talking about batteries and current, and also introduce the concept of resistance. So first, first off, we need to understand that um, whenever I have a voltage difference or an electric potential difference, okay, uh, we looked at this in the last unit, but that potential difference causes the charges to move either from high voltage to low voltage, or in the case of electrons, from low voltage to high voltage, okay? So an electron would be moving from point B to point A, okay, or the, from 50 volts to 70 volts in this picture. Okay, and that movement of charges or the movement of electrons is what we are going to call current. And to generate that, we have batteries. Okay, batteries we're pretty familiar with. Uh, here I have an example of five different sizes of batteries. The most common type that we have is the one and a half volt battery shown uh, here is the, the four round batteries. Um, but we also have batteries of other sizes. Okay, uh, the Duracell, uh, the nine volt battery all the way on the right. Um, our cars have 12 volt batteries, um, and we have the little small disc batteries uh, that we put in uh, calculators or watches and uh, other aspects. Okay, so there are all sorts of different voltages and different sizes. The different sizes, really, um, besides the voltage that the battery has, uh, the size determines what the maximum amount of current or the maximum amount of charge at any one point in time that the battery can provide as well as how long the battery will last. Okay, um, Just to cover, uh, batteries provide us with pretty much a constant voltage. Okay, And for our intents and purposes, that voltage will be a constant 1.5 or 3 or whatever the number happens to be, and it stays that way forever. Okay, In real life, we know that it doesn't last forever. We have to charge our cell phones, replace batteries all the time. Um, and to avoid replacing batteries, we have electricity delivered to our house via the sockets. Okay. Although you don't need to know this, I think uh, it's important to cover what the socket in your house looks like. There's, uh, it's the most common socket we have now is this three-pronged socket. The slot on the left is slightly larger than the slot on the, life, or on the right. That allows what uh, we call polarized plugs and it allows us to only um, to basically allow the current to go in one uh, orientation for safety's sake. Okay, it also helps us to um, basically allow for uh, certain equipment to function correctly. Okay, um, the right slot is the live slot. Do not ever stick anything in that slot because that's the one that will actually give you an electric charge and potentially electrocute you. The left slot Okay, you could stick things in and it really won't hurt you, assuming that your uh, whoever wired your house did so correctly. Okay, in general, it's not worth taking a bet that it wasn't some uh, person who did it incorrectly, so uh, it's better to never stick anything in the sockets. The bottom one is what we call uh, the earth or ground uh, slot. Okay, that actually connects up to two metal spikes outside your house that really go into the ground and help to discharge. Uh, electric equipment so they don't build up charge over time. Okay, I've talked about current and um, current is measured in a unit that we call amperes or use the letter A. Frequently I'll just shorten the word amperes to amps. Okay, and current is the amount of charge that passes a point in a certain unit of time, usually just one second. Okay, so one ampere corresponds to one coulomb of charge in one second. Okay, current is a scalar, um, but it does have some direction properties. Okay, so if I have a negative current, it implies that the current is flowing in the opposite direction. It's not a full vector, okay, because I don't ever have to take components, um, but it does have a direction property in positive and negative aspects. Okay, when we get into circuits a little more, uh, that'll be a little more clear uh, to you. So here's a question for practice, okay? I want you to answer this question and come back to me in class uh, next time with the answer to this, okay? Um, so you can pause it and solve it. I'm going to continue on. 
So we have a thing called conventional current, and that's what we're always going to be using in this class. Okay, unless I'm specifically asking about electrons, okay, conventional current is defined as the flow of positive charges. In reality, we realize that the electron is the charge that moves, okay, and uh, an electron is negative. So we're imagining that uh, instead of electrons flowing in one direction, the positive charges are actually flowing in the other direction. The reason we have that convention is because Benjamin Franklin, way back in the 1700s, um, was doing a lot of investigation into electricity and determined that there were two charges, okay, that either repelled or attracted each other, okay, similar to what we did with the electroscope. Okay, he made it, basically flipped a coin and said, well, I don't know, I'm going to call the positive ones, but that's what actually moves. Okay, so a lot of physicists until, you know, the early 1900s basically went with that assumption that the positive charges move. Um, and uh, because it's complicated, uh, we're basically stuck with that. Okay, we could make the change back uh, and describe uh, electrons as being positive. All we know is that positive and negatives are opposite each other. Okay, it's a matter of changing signs in some equations, and so some get added, some get deleted. Uh, nobody really wants to learn relearn the equations. So instead, we just keep pretending that positive charges flow in our circuit. Uh, and that's good enough for most situations. Okay? So, a couple of words that I'm going to go through, okay? We're going to go through three words that are very similar, okay? The words are resistance, okay? Which is the <coughs> numerical value for what we're going to call a resistor, okay? A resistor is the physical object, okay? And then resistivity is a property of a material, okay? So one by one, resistance is the property, okay, or the numerical value of, res of uh, an object to slow down the flow of charges. Okay, we measure resistance in ohms, this uh, kind of horseshoe looking sign, it's actually the Greek letter omega. Um, and so resistance is a scalar, it's always going to be positive, Okay, and the units for it are basically ohms. Okay, it basically converts electrical energy primarily into thermal energy. Resistivity, however, is the property of a substance. Okay, so uh, copper will have a different resistivity from gold, which will have a different resistivity than water or glass. Okay, conductors, remember, conductors allow the flow of electricity very easily. So they have low resistivity. They do, do not resist the flow of charges. Insulators, however, have high resistivity. How high and how low? Here's a table. You don't have to memorize it. Um, but it gives you a sense of the resistivities of different materials. For instance, on top, we have silver, copper, and gold, the standard metals that we see in wires. Um, they have resistivities on the order of 10 to the minus 8. Okay. In the middle, bottom middle, okay, we see germanium and silicon. Those don't even have exponents, uh, though, uh, so they have orders of magnitude of minus one to plus two. Okay, those are our semiconductors. Okay, on the high end of the scale, okay, we have our insulators like glass and rubber. Okay, they have orders of magnitude of 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 14. So we're talking a large number of zeros, okay, between um, the conductors and the insulators. And this table gives you a basic sense of how many zeros or what the range of possible values is. Okay, so the resistance of a wire, okay, is going to be proportional to its length. Okay, the longer the wire is, the more chance of something in the wire, primarily the nucleus of the atoms, okay, the more chance of something in the wire getting in the way with the flow of electrons. Okay, so it, as I make my wire longer, my resistance is going to increase. Okay, um, as I increase the cross-sectional area of my wire, my resistance is going to drop because a wider wire gives me more room for the electrons to flow through the wire. Okay, and so the full formula for resistance of a wire is given by, by this. That says resistance is equal to this Greek letter rho. 
it looks like a P, but it's pronounced row, similar to row, row, row your boat. Um, and uh, it's drawn, I draw it from the bottom up, so it looks slightly different from a standard P. Okay, so the resistance is equal to the resistivity, that number we saw in the previous table, times the length of the wire divided by the cross-sectional area. Okay, and that's basically what a resistor is. Okay, just a section of wire uh, that resists the flow of electrons. Okay, so here, again, here's a practice slide, okay? Any practice slide I want you to do at home. And so I, here I have five wires all made of the same material, so they all have the same row, okay? And out of these five wires, which wire has the least resistance? And part B, which wire has the greatest resistivity? Okay, and I want you to come back next class with those answers for me. Thank you.